Hello, everybody, and welcome to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum Midweek Program. Today, we are in the glass houses at the Horticultural Field Lab behind the HFL because it is cold and gross outside, and we want to be inside talking about plants. We're doing February gardening tasks today, and you know, there's lots of days like this in February, so it's a, it's a good time to show you what you can do on days like this. Okay. And so with the announcements out of the way, we are ready for some February gardening tasks. So Tim and Sophia, what might we do in this month of February? Well, today we didn't know what we were going to do because we didn't know what the rain was going to, what the day was going to hold as far as uh, weather. And we actually had volunteers show up this afternoon. We were like, why are you here? <laughs> it's cold. No one wants to work outside. So we came up with some ideas for what to do inside, and we have some cool things to show you. We're down here in my domain in the nursery, um, in the glass house, so it's nice and warm in here, which is why everything's awake. We've got some flowers blooming. Um, Tim's gonna talk a little bit about- Planning. Planning. He likes to do that. He's got some show and tell for us about his, uh, Y'all remember the seeds we sowed last month? Oh, was that yeah. January? It was in January. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but and then I have a few things that you can do when it, the weather's a little better next or in the next oh, it looks like next week here. Maybe, Maybe Friday. Uh, and next week looks wonderful here in Raleigh. Um, but uh, today and tomorrow, <clears throat> not the greatest of being outside. So we do have some indoor projects for you as well. So you wanna start off with start, yours? Start with the so something that we've been doing. Yeah, so when the volunteers came in, we were like, you don't want to work inside. What are you talking about? Or you don't want to work outside. Uh, we had them, I had some cuttings left over from our, <laughs> our propagation workshops this week. And I said, well, you know what? We need to do a quick, quick demo and talk about um, some things that are good to do this time of year. Um, we've got... I don't remember the name. Oh, we have hardwood cuttings here hardwood to begin with cuttings. anyways. but um, <laughs> Of all so, kinds, in all stages. And I gave you a few samples there. This is one Tim brought in. This is a fresh cutting. This is a perfect time to do camellias. Yeah, um, and we did actually, I mean, in the fall too, but now it was my first experience of doing camellias yep. was in January and February. Yep, and uh, Tim likes to talk about uh, the first time he had experience doing cuttings with camellias. Mm -hmm. Was you can actually take individual leaf one, cuttings with yeah. a node and a, a little stem. Yeah, you don't have to have a big long one. So say you are visiting a friend and um, you see that they have a camellia you really like. This is what you I can actually do. I haven't done leaf cuttings here because I try to usually do stem cuttings because but you get a couple that's nodes. That's a little small, but I mean, you could use that. You get the node a little, or the, the inner node a little bit bigger. But then my first time someone brought in a really pretty white flowered camellia called Lois Coker. And that was like the first month I was working here at the Arboretum, now 17 years ago. And my assistant and I at that time, we hacked up that piece. We, we left the flowering part on top and we took the bottom two thirds of this stem and we made a half a dozen nice cuttings out of it. And um, so. And but, this, uh, I brought you this, I brought this over. This is one that, like we said, camellias do well all winter, all. Fall and uh, all winter, fall a, a and good winter. time to and do these, it. Are not greatly rooted yet, but you know, it takes time. I think this was um, September, October. September, October, maybe even August. Okay. Um, but you can see it's a it's a little bit wetter than it wants to be, um, but you can see it's it's rooted and it's working on it. But it's still I wouldn't pot this up yet. They're not quite ready to be potted up. Um, another thing that we were talking about that came up in our class is this in Acostia. I mean, are those from the same time period or were those from another time? No, those, those were, were from last year. Those were from earlier, I okay. think springtime. Okay, late, um, um, some late cuttings then. Yeah, I think they were in the spring, mm -hmm. I wanna say. So camellia cuttings can take a long time, but um, as long as they're green and, you know, have live buds, these are, um, one thing I was gonna talk about was the, the different buds. So there's floral buds and vegetative buds. And when you're taking cuttings this time of year, you don't particularly want, well, anytime you don't want floral buds, ideally. It's 
uh, it depends because with propagation, everything has, every rule ha is broken. Mm -hmm. Some plant will break a rule. Oh, these if there, can never get away from salvias and other things, herbaceous stuff. Uh, almost never. Yeah, so you can't avoid it. But, but with camellias, it takes a lot of energy to produce this flower. Um, it starts out with a, this is a, this is a smaller flower bud, um, but you can see it's round and kind of swollen looking. And right next to it is the floral bud. Or the vegetative bud. Vegetative, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> it's opposite day, y'all. <laughs> this is the, the vegetative bud. And you can see that's kind of narrow and pointy. Um, so they look very different side by side, but looking at them, one or the other may be a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with it. So this one, you can see, obviously this is a floral bud breaking out and we don't really need him. We don't need this one to be putting a show on for us. It just, we need it to grow. So that's a vegetative bud. And then that's the floral bud. You can see, this is a smaller one. I, I don't remember exactly is which that one it is. Is that transnocoensis or something like that? I don't remember. It's one of the smaller flowers. Or Faterna maybe? Which I I'm really, not sure which one I it really is either like. offhand. Um, and of course I grabbed one without a tag. That's okay. But I grabbed one to show the floral bud. And this, what you can do then, like Sophia was doing, you can snap those off and, yep. uh, and then you it, sacrifice it, but it'll help the plant out and get it, this more established. It'll get, yeah, it'll, it'll put its energy out of that reproductive phase and back into some vegetative growth and some roots, hopefully. So basically we have a bunch of cutting, different but cuttings different, here. We have some, a lot of conifers work really well at this time. That is not pines and spruce and stuff, though there are certain spruce you can do, but uh, for us here in the south, podocarpus are great. This is a, a variegated one. Uh, this was a pruning, actually. I just quickly took off. It was kind of a lanky branch, but this would work fine. Platycletus, which is a, a, a oriental arborvitae. Wonderful rooters at this time of the year. And cryptomeria, for instance. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we can easily root at this time of the year. Uh, they do take patience. Yes, yeah, so they they're, they're slow. A, they will take, you're, you're looking at a year-long process to go from a cutting to a plant that you might consider putting in the ground. So what's that thing that I have in that, that last, that broadleaf thing straight in front of you? How hard are those? Oh, these are, you know what? If you can't root <laughs> these, then you might as well just give up. That's just, one of Just our, never propagate again. <laughs> one of our many akubas. One of which, our many <laughs> akubas, which, these have not been fertilized. And I'm pretty sure the media we use does not come have, with fertilizer. And these are from October. And you can see they're literally trying to grow out of their pots. <laughs> they're like, pot me up! They're trying to be mangroves. <sighs> <laughs> so that's always fun because these are a really good illustration of how do I tell when my cuttings are ready to pot up? And that is what my rule of thumb is when you can lift them out and they, the media kind of holds its shape. Like <laughs> if this was not in a kuba, I probably wouldn't quite pot it up because you can see um, you can see it's kind of still falling apart. I'd like a few more roots on there before I potted it up. But since it's in a kuba, we'll just throw it in a pot and it'll be fine. <laughs> Once we give it fertilizer, yep. it'll take off. So not everything has to have leaves, does it? At this time, it's a, oh, it's no, cutting, we've got so. um, some cornice. I'm going to yeah. guess. Tim didn't yeah, tell that, me what these were. That's cornice, uh, elba, uh, minbot. It It is... Uh, Baton Rouge is the trade name on that one. Uh, so Yeah, they're really cool. They're super easy. They don't have leaves, so they don't transpire. So they don't take as much of the TLC that some of the herbaceous cuttings will take. Um, like your Akubas, you'd want to put a dome over. And yeah. They're easy, but like you still don't want them to dry out. And for and those, then, you can just actually push those into the ground probably and get them to root outside. Yeah. And then I gave her, you know, another one there, but I don't know if you want to touch it, but that'll bounce off to what I want to talk about here in a little Tim's while. Been, we'll get Tim's there. been, Tim's uh, been, I've been in Rose in the Garden Rose world. Garden, and he's gonna. This one's not in the Rose Garden, but this is one of my favorites actually. This is Rosa Radprov, which I can't remember. It's cultivar, or the trade name. That's, that's the true name is Radprov. But it's, uh, it's a, a Floribunda rose. It has a beautiful old antique rose look to it and wonderful fragrance. And this is one I would love to propagate some more of. Uh, I have one in the perennial border, um, but um, it is a, a very prickly 
um, one to work with. This is one but that I... Not, roses don't have thorns, so... But I um, don't but, want the nursery, Tim. We don't why? like this one. Uh, but I can't pick it up! <laughs> it one smells wonderful, but anyways. <laughs> yeah, and cuttings on those are super easy. Yeah. Um, you could, again, because it doesn't have leaves, you can go pretty big. You can go something like that. Get, I typically would go for like a three node cutting at least. That's exactly yeah. a three node cutting. Yeah. And then we have a couple pieces up here we could work <laughs> yeah. out with too, so. Okay. Ooh. So those are just some fun things. And we just use general rooting hormones on these, but you can, yeah. we've been doing both powders, uh, like a one in, or two hormidin, which are two of your common grades, or some, uh, we've been playing around with gels now gel. I and have found, had wonderful results with gels. I have yet to find anything that does not like the gel. Yeah. We have pretty good success with the gel, even on things that it's, are. It's a bit more expensive, hard. I will say that. Yeah. Probably to, uh, you don't get as many cuttings with it, but the, the benefits of the powdered hormidin and stuff, the powdered ones, it's like, as long as you don't get it uh, uh, dirt in it, or that is, you, you take your, you take a, a, t a small amount of it out and use it in another container. Don't cross-contaminate. Uh, don't cross-contaminate. Um, the powder will, is very stable and will have very long shelf life, and you can get lots of cuttings out of that. Um, I'm going to show you a couple things, uh, if you see begonias, that we have for sale. Well, we have, we're going to have to get rid of them somehow. <laughs> um, I love begonias because they're so weird. Um, you can actually do them by leaf cuttings. So this, we went into the garden before we had a first, before we had a really harsh frost, and we got a bunch of begonias. And we did them a couple different ways. So these were actually, those are leaf I think cutting, those yeah. were just leaves as well. Yeah, those are leaves. That, the, um, this was a stem. Uh, brother Montgomery, little brother Montgomery is a stem cutting. I that think. was a stem, so, yeah. which you could see those did the, not. The, this, I can't spit this one out real well. It's Cote de Castillon, uh, which is a, a little leaf. Uh, and uh, it, it's can, super vigorous from leaf cuttings. If you zoom in there, is it the, the, that little center point of the, of the flower or the leaf. Where the what petiole and the leaf uh, blade actually merge. Yeah, that um, shoots up and it becomes yeah. little, like multiple plants. And I think they this form is, actually on the leaf petiole itself because this is coming up from well a base, away from the base of the leaf. Yeah. And, and then this, that funky thing, this, this is one, one of the largest begonias. Was really cool. <laughs> and uh, it had leaves like we this. We were, again, we went out and took a bunch of cuttings and these petioles were, probably 12 inches long. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know, like, I I don't think I could possibly divide this into each individual There's like two plants. or three leaves there at most. Yeah. And then we, and then we I, experimented with just leaf petioles and they rooted. Our student our student was like, you can't do that by petiole. What do so you I mean? Said, it's not gonna work. Try it. it's not gonna so work. he said, let's try anything. it. And you can see this is the, this is the petiole and they were stuck in right here and <laughs> it's come up with new plants. And this, so they will, they will That reproduce. one looks like you cut and they actually rooted all, yeah. all over. You can, um, another way to do these that I learned in school was that the, the, that where the petiole and the leaf meet will reproduce, but also you can cut the begonia leaf itself. And as long as it is in contact and kept with the media and kept moist, um, you will get, see there's the, see I'm tearing the leaf but you can see where the, the leaf has actually sprouted. I'm pretty sure begonias are aliens. I don't Not all of them you can do this with though. Like the wax yeah, begonias you can't do this with, so. But the but, ones that do this are wild. Or they're cr uh, really cool. A lot yeah. of the rhizominous ones. So that's probably about it for your stuff. I can be oh, done. Okay. I guess I'll let you talk now. Yeah, normally she, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I got some stuff ready. This morning I've been, actually I was preparing for a talk that I'm gonna do for you guys next month, but also uh, in recent weeks, I've been going through our rose garden and ripping out diseased roses. We've had major issues with rose rosette and uh, we try to take minimal, um, we don't spray in our rose garden. We try to keep it low maintenance and do like a homeowner, but, and also not have those harsh chemicals. So we taken it uh, into account that we're gonna have to uh, get rid of some things. So I have some big holes and I've been thinking, we're, gonna, we're not gonna put roses right back in them uh, right now. We're gonna swap some other things out. And so I've taken, oh, had um, one of our wor uh, coworkers now actually print me out a map. You guys could draw a map, but uh, I started drawing in some ideas. I wanna put some hibiscus 
in the background. And I have some dahlia seedlings that I think I'm going to get from Bernadette that she might have spare from the trials, I'm hoping. And you said you said they could draw a map. Um, there are free programs yeah. that could do that. Uh, uh, probably yeah, CAD-esque CAD, type things. Uh, I can't think of I a don't free know. one. I'm going to blank now. I'm, I, personally, I'm actually much better on the, the draw it by hand myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, you know, and a beautiful one. So I'm getting ideas. So uh, I'm getting some ideas of what I might want. So the other thing you can be doing after you get those ideas, or you can be looking for ideas and go through your catalog stash that you have. You know, you know, plant delights, John, uh, some are for annuals and stuff. Uh, there's a variety here. Some of these are old catalogs, so I didn't have any of fresh ones. Uh, but uh, Brent and Becky's, as I've mentioned numerous times, they're one and of our great a, sources. It's a little late to be ordering your spring flowering bulbs. These, they've just, this catalog just came out this month. But, the, so. but that would be the summer bulbs. These are the summer bulbs, so, yeah. but Brent and Becky bulbs, so, um, you know, get yourself some ideas. It's I never like, used to think when I was working in landscaping, I never used to think of bulbs as like dahlias, or I used to think, you know, narcissus, the... Um, yeah, like dahlias, that, yeah. technically they aren't bulbs, They're but not technically they have tuberous bulbs. roots and, yeah. um, and but, but to get we one, lump them. Yeah, but to get ones that are like more perennial yes. and not the annual and ones. For us in this area, we can grow so many dahlias as perennials, so. And they're less expensive when you can buy them bare root. Yeah. So anyways, that was what I've been planning on doing. Um, and I've been planning ahead, hopefully, because I'm stuck inside. And I know we just did a recent, I have another source of plant material, our recent inventory that we did, but we now have a pretty good idea of what we have in our nursery and I can take it into account. So that's kind of my shopping. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, so I'm planning ahead for spring on these rainy days. I can start drawing some things out and I'm like, what I might put in some place and get your mind uh, going a little bit. And did you say where that is? So this is in our rose garden, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, in our rose oh. garden. This is just one little section of it. But uh, I've also, so another thing, I've actually already pruned some of our roses. It's a little early, but just because I had free time, uh, it was a dry place to be working in these recent weeks when we've been having a rainy night and a rainy weekend, and it's too muddy to get in other parts of the garden. It's a really well, our soils there are really good. And there had been some other maintenance I wanted to do in there, so I've been in there. And so rose pruning is on another project. Project you can do at this time of the year, not on a rainy day like today, but um, on another uh, relatively well, nice could, dry day. You could bundle up. Yeah. But it might tear your rain gear. Yeah. And so. My hands, I, I haven't pruned any this week, but last week my hands were just eaten up. But every, anyways, oh, can I have Every my, day Tim <laughs> would come in and be like, oh, I'm bleeding well, today again. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's just a, it's a flesh wound. But anyway, so with the roses, they are so prone to disease. I try to uh, disinfect my pruners frequently. If not between every rose, if between every cultivar rose. And something I found that's very handy, and you know, you probably have some of this. Who has hand sanitizer left from when we were all... <gasps> Uh, a little bit hyper, um, uh, uh, trying to uh, combat COVID before we knew what anything uh, did. So what I've been doing is carrying my spare <clears throat> hand sanitizer around and, oh, I don't have it open. I have it locked, I think. And I still have it locked. I think get this. This <laughs> one's been in my car of all things. There we go. I just put a dab on it and I get the alcohol there. So it's just like wiping my hands with it. One thing to note on those, especially some of the like scented or especially the gel ones, um, check your alcohol percentage. This is only a 65% alcohol. I want to say 70 is ideal for ideal. pathogens. But so if, you're, if you do use this hack, just double check your, your alcohol percentage because it may not kill everything. And this will kill more than uh, I wouldn't be uh, <laughs> if I didn't do it at all. But Roses are very prone to disease. So uh, I have a rose here. This is not one from the rose garden. This one will hopefully end up in the rose garden. This is a drift rose that we had in the nursery. And it's actually, this has had minimal protection, but it is actively growing already. But I don't know if um, Alexander can sh uh, point out, but I actually have some dead in here. So what I'd be looking for on your roses, if nothing else, look for dead branches. And there's some bad cuts on here. This came from a, a nursery where they kind of just did an overall shearing. So you can go back um, and find you know, bad branches, whether you broke them by in passing uh, or a tree fell on it, you know, whatever. Uh, you can get out dead and injured branches is what you want to do, if nothing else. If you're not uh, sure what to take out of a rose, um, those are where you can start. And then if it's really vigorous, you can thin it. Um, 
So open things up because they do need some decent air circulation to keep them healthy. Um, you're reducing the number of buds that are down in there and also letting light down in so you'll get new buds to break that are more vigorous than say some of the twiggier growth that's been in there. If this had not been cut back, it would probably still have uh, spent florets on it, much like on this rose here uh, that I have an inflorescence. So this is really not um, prime for um, uh, to, ha to leave on the plant because this is where it flowered last year. So you just simply just chop it off uh, and you have a nice new bud down here. Uh, if you get stuff that you don't want that's just long and lanky, you can also bring back the shoots. Uh, but same idea here. Um, we're gonna open it up a little bit and that's something you can do. I'm not gonna finish this one right now, but the other thing, I don't know if you can see in here, there's leaf litter. Uh, about a, I forget if it was October or when, or uh, November, I was talking about, you know, leave the leaves. But in this case with roses, I tend to try to get rid of as many of the old leaves as possible. Uh, the drift roses are pretty disease resistant foliar wise. Uh, so they don't suffer from a ton of leaf spot, but a lot of your other roses get major summer fungal issues like leaf spots and they will defoliate. So one way you can help to eliminate some of that is to go in and rake out all the, the leaf material that's in there uh, the best you can. I know, floor. I know, I'm trying not to. Uh, <laughs> Doing things inside versus outside is a challenge. And then you can uh, throw your fresh mulch in there um, after you've cleaned everything out. And that's what we've actually done in our rose garden last week and this week. My volunteers helped yesterday finally get the rose garden mulched in, which is wonderful. But February is a wonderful time to be doing that. So another project that, um, whether it's in a rose garden or, or <laughs> not, um, is doing cutting back some things. Uh, I, typically, the end of February, I want to cut my grasses back, um, and so uh, this is a panicum I stole from um, uh, or borrowed hour. from uh, uh, another section here at the uh, the Hort Field Lab. And they won't bother, uh, won't be upset that I've taken this, but uh, I don't know. I have a few weeds in here too uh, that bring have come them all. up. And I'm over here hyperventilating. Yeah, this, this, those weeds. I these aren't going to seed yet. That's the benefit right here. These aren't going to seed yet. Uh, but what I like to use cutting back grasses during the winter months is a, an old handsaw. This one is one that oh, was donated actually. It's not very sharp, but it's sharp enough to, to uh, put a notch in my finger if I wanted to, but um, it's a little bit rusty. I wouldn't want to use this on a tree, but it's perfect to do cutting back of grasses. Um, and as Sophia is hyperventilating, oh, you're spreading. Um, uh, it's relatively easy to get in into your grasses then and uh, cut them back. And also, since I said this one had some weeds in it, you can get in and then do all the cool season weeds. This one has vetch in it, and then it has some geraniums growing in among it as well. Uh, just to name a couple of things that are coming up in this pot. Um, but. Um, uh, and there's something else on this side. It looks like an, uh, a, a flea bane. But anyways, you can easily get through a grass with a, 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 an older handsaw. I don't recommend using your brand new one, but if you have to, if you don't have one yet, use your brand new one. But uh, So you can make quick, uh, um, quickly get through your grasses to get them done. Uh, and I also like to do my... <coughs> Uh, if anybody has pompous grass, I don't cut them back too early and I only do them every couple years if I have to. Uh, but this winter we had a hard, uh, with the hard freeze in December, uh, when it got down to the single digits, they're a little bit worse for wear. And um, it was last year I actually did a major cutback on most of our, our pompous grass or quartered areas. And I normally would let them go two to three years between prunings, but I'm gonna have to get in there again. But I like to do them because they are very armored. They have serrated leaf edges and will cut you. I like to do those before it gets too warm. And uh, to get in there with a saw, you can actually, <laughs> hate to say it, use a chainsaw to be have to be very careful and clean them because they, they fill up with uh, so much debris in them. But, or a really good hedge trimmer. You can get in there and you can cut those back relatively easily. Though they, are, they do get quite large. But um, Where did February is a really, late February is a really good time to do that.
Show the cane. And the cane. so, yeah, I'm going to, uh, so I got through some of those. Those are some things you can actually do out in the garden. And then I'm just going to do some updates. Uh, so um, last month uh, in, in January, uh, I think I showed you I was sowing elephant ear seedlings or seeds. And now I have seedlings. These are the giant elephant ears, literally. These are the Thailand giant, um, Colocasia gigantea, Thailand giant strain. Uh, and I sowed these just about a month ago. Uh, now, I think it was the first week in January uh, that we sowed these. So, um, and they're already up and they will be growing. These are some that we've been torturing that I never got transplanted last year, but these just got transplanted. And these have already probably doubled in size in the last couple of weeks since they've been uh, taken out of their torture chamber, but we'll have some fresh ones. So hopefully we'll have a, a bunch of these for sale come uh, late April or in, into May. Um, Maybe for blooms? for for Ralston Bloom. Ralston so Bloom. It, those are something right there um, that has done. And way back in, I'm going to say in October, probably I talked about propagating some things to take in for the winter. I don't think these aren't the exact ones I did, but I did do some of these. These are some two grasses that I love that I can't readily get uh, consistently. So uh, if you've heard me talking about um, Penicetum purpureum. Uh, black stockings, that's what these are here, the dark stemmed ones here. And then we have this ornamental corn, this, um, uh, let's see, this is uh, Zia perennis, and I, I will never remember the cultivar on it, but anyways. So can I dump the big other pot I have of that? No, I'm going to have that just as a backup. <laughs> but anyways, I always try to keep some of these um, through the winter. I love them. They do great in the landscape for us. And these are what came from calm cuttings, which I can, I can you see those in there, the, the actual uh, calms or stems from the grass laid horizontally in here. You can also do them vertically, but I, uh, horizontally they root right in. Um, and I can chop these up. I got two to three plants per uh, piece of calm I put in here and I can just um, cut them in pieces and pot them all up. And I will have, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, it looks like easily of the, um, Penicetum and probably one, two, three, four, five, six or so uh, of the corn. Uh, uh, and these, there. I've, these I've not been taking great care of. These are ones that they're will fine take, and dandy. That will take some abuse. This is pretty dry. Yeah, that's dry. Yeah. That's pretty dry. It's been I mean, over in a corner. What are they? Um, C, is it C three or C four plants? They're corn. You know, it's <laughs> they're able to take a little bit of drought. So. Yeah. Uh, those are some of the things I have. Do you have anything else? Uh, I'm not anything else except other than some show and tell. There's some cool things because we're inside and it's warm. Um, we have some things blooming. We've got some pretty abutilons. Just starting. These are some Just of our cuttings. Starting. This is uh, butylon uh, megapotamicum ruffles, which um, I think are ones in the garden. And most of them got burnt back pretty well, but they're gonna they'll survive. They'll sprout back up from the back up from the base. But this was flowering in here. Uh, and we have some other uh, beautiful ones right here that aren't yet flowering, but this is one voodoo, which I really love, a red one. Uh, and then uh, right here is a Eucomus dark star, which uh, I think, is this going to be one of our cornisor plants? I don't Or not, okay. I don't know. We, these I don't are know. some we were I don't know where it's destined. To get, so, it's destined uh, to be distributed somewhere. Somehow, yes. Uh, We've got some pretty elephant ears. Yep. So. Well, I'm not sure which one that is. Uh, which Blackwater? Blackwater, okay. But, yeah. And then, anyways, we remind have, you of spring. Yes, or tropical weather on this cool <laughs> day. Uh, so uh, warm you up a little bit. Uh, so any questions of what we sure? Let's uh, let's do some propagation questions real quick. Somebody asked if this would be a good time to do edgeworthia cuttings. Uh, actually, you can do edgeworth. You can do hardwood edgeworthia as well. Hardwood. Uh, if the ones if it's that the, yeah. The ideal shoots are the ones if how if they have an older plant that is throwing up shoots from the base. You know those are excellent. Sometimes you can actually tug them off mm. the, the shoots that are right down at the base of the trunk, and they may have roots on them already. But uh, if not, you can do them as a hardwood cutting as well. Cool. How about rhododendron? I don't know. I'm not good with rhododendron. Okay. Theoretically, you can might be able to do some of the azaleas. Uh, that is the Asian azaleas. The deciduous uh, American ones tend to not be yeah. harder to root at this In time In my of personal year. experience with those ones, you wait till around May or yeah. something at a point where the stem, when you when you bend it, it snaps. Again, there's like two day period that I think it actually works. It's yeah, like you just, if you do it, if you bend it and it doesn't snap, then <laughs> it's not ready. And if you bend it and it snaps, it's ready. And then you take the softwood cutting yeah. off of that. And I've yeah. never had luck okay. doing the big leafed ones, but- Which one uh, is that? The, the, the native azaleas. The native yeah, ones? the deciduous yeah. ones. 
Catavensis types, which they root all the time. I don't, I'm not good at those. I don't know if now's a good time or not. I need to do a little more research because I was on the NC extension page and they suggest they did for hardwood now. cuttings for uh, rhododendron. So Okay. But, I don't know which, uh, but what but kind of rhododendron. Just, it was just rhododendron, so I don't know. So what it might it was. have been Formosa type azalea, a rhododendron, or the azaleas, yeah. which I could see that. Um, there's so many different species of azaleas and rhododendrons that it's sometimes hard to generalize what's going to yeah. root when. So, okay. Griffin's asking, what fertilizer do you recommend right at the time you move a plant to a pot? Probably just a, 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 I mean, I tend to do a controlled release. Yeah. You might give it some time. Something that's uh, uh, well, rather balanced. Also, it depends on what you're using. Are you transplanting it so that it will live in the pot or are you yeah. taking it out of the ground? Because if you're putting it in a pot temporarily so you can move it, maybe not anything. But if you're repotting it to live in the pot permanently, um, check and make sure your, your potting media doesn't have charged because a yeah. lot of the a lot yeah. of the homeowner or like miracle grow stuff miracle the stuff grow, that you get from Lowe's they're, you're going to have something if it's advertised charge. as potting media it probably has a fertilizer charge in it and so double check so you're not double feeding you might not need to fertilize for three months three sometimes six, six even yeah. yeah ours specifically does not come with nutrients in it so that's why I use the that's why I top dress because it does not come with the nutrients. Okay, well that actually kind of segues into a next question. What's your growing media recipe? So I don't even, it's 4P, and I don't, don't know off the top of my head what it no, is. No, it's... Because we work, because we're with yeah. the university, they supply um, a lot of our propagation media. Uh, it's just on a pallet, and it <laughs> shows up, and I use that. Um, but it's a peat perlite and some bark mix. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's not, um, it's like not a quarter or anything. It's like, yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know why, I don't know what 4P, I don't, I'm sure in, in Maybe media, there's four different components. In, in a media land, it yeah. has a meeting, um, <laughs> but it is what is in the head house when I go and get. <laughs> the price is right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I do know because it's research, because a lot of the, a lot of research goes on in this facility and you know, all the, all the research programs use it and they all want to be able to fine tune their, um, their fertilizer. So they, that's why it's, there's no charge. It's in sterile. It. Yeah. It's, ster it's clean. Another thing with propagation is making sure you've got clean media. Um, and it's consistent. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, this is it. You can see it's got, it's got some, it's definitely got bark in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, and while we've got a beautiful shot of begonias, somebody asked when will these begonias be on the plant buggy? If they'll be <laughs> so on the buggy. I have to ask people higher than me what goes in plant buggy versus what we keep for other other programs. Because we just or went for the garden. Mark and I just went, or Tim and I just went through the lath house before frost and took a bunch of cuttings. Somewhat of insurance on some of them. Yeah, and make sure if, in case we lose them. So we might plant them back out. Mm -hmm. If, if we didn't make it through this winter, we might plant them back out and see if they do better. Maybe we won't have that. Or plant one in a new location in the garden that we haven't tried. Yeah. The, a lot of them are in our last house, which is kind of like the cushy place to be growing. We might try to torture them somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. So with regards to rose trimming, uh -huh. are the things you said uh, applicable to knockout roses? Well? So uh, what I did was very uh, basic, but yeah, knockouts... You can be, uh, if it's rather vigorous and well-established, you can be nasty to them. That is, you can cut them down within a foot of the ground and they'll come up and re, uh, regrow. The only thing is, uh, just when you're doing it, knockouts are one of the ones that I said, I mentioned rose rosette uh, virus, which is a major issue for us in the garden. They're some of the worst ones I see in the landscape. So you may, if you see any funky growths on them, if you have rose rosette, I mean, on knockout, it's... It's, it's, it's doing more than trimming. It's digging it out and removing it. Yep. Uh, and that's what we did in the rose garden. And ideally not putting uh, that same rose back in. I mean, you could just try to get, make sure you have something that starts out clean. The yeah. thing is that the, the, what causes or spreads the rose rosette is a tiny little mite that floats through the ground or fruits through the ground, floats through the air, not through the ground. And, um, so your neighbor oh, two miles away might have rose rosette and the and mites, and then the wind picks up and it blows them over onto your roses. And it's literally two miles. 
Uh, so it spreads super easy. Super um, easy. But some really good... uh, in my experience, uh, the knockouts are some of the worst ones uh, a for showing it. There's a couple different signs. There's some really good They resources. get witches brooms. And, yeah. and uh, they look cool, but they just slowly die and yeah. spread bruisers at the So, But if you have them. a healthy uh, knockout, you can take it down to, I saw some in a parking lot actually on Sunday, or no, Monday, so two days ago, uh, at my, where my grocery store is, and they were taken down to about this big, and they had been three to four feet tall. And even if you had a plant that got eight feet tall, which knocked out uh, the rad, uh, the original one, um, it's rad something, anyways, um, uh, you could cut it down to within uh, a, a few inches of the ground and it wouldn't kill it. And it'll re, uh, regrow back up. So uh, they're very forgiving. Okay. Aside from the fact that they do get rose rosette. Cool. Yeah. Somebody asked a question pertaining to renewal pruning yep. of hydrangeas. They said they did it last year and they got a bunch of new growth, yep. but in the center trunk, there's a lot of dead. They're okay. Wondering if that's normal or. Um, yeah, you're, I mean, I'm guessing it's a macrophylla, but yes, typically the centers of your plants are going to die out uh, unless if, because they are hydrangeas are almost more like a, a perennial to me than that they, they don't have a central trunk. They, they kind of expand out and they uh, round the edges and you'll get new buds, but you'll often get some dye out in the center and, it, uh, and you can remove that dead wood. And that's whenever you're doing renewal pruning, pruning, if nothing else, go in there and take out the dead. That's what I did in our rose garden. I, if nothing else, I was cutting it back so I could get in to take out the dead and um, clean it up, open it up so you get more light in there. And so if you take out that dead stuff in the center, you, you probably get some new uh, replacement growth uh, on that hydrangea as well from the center that will ultimately fill back in some. When I was working in landscaping, I would do that a lot is yeah. go in and prune out. And I like my technique, I wouldn't even use a pr like pruners, but if you yeah. just kind of go in. If it's truly dead. If you just you kind of go in and like tug on it or like bend it a little bit, a live piece of wood won't break off yeah. and the dead piece of wood will break off. So you yeah. can literally just go through and it's a little bit easier on your back and you're not getting up and down. You can go in and Hydrangeas Maybe. are pretty easy to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Somebody asked about uh, pruning back grasses. They said, if you don't mind the messy look, can you just leave them? Sure. But... In the wild, uh, in the, I mean, in, actually, I mean, in the wild, what would naturally clean them out might be in a, a periodic fire. So it might be three to uh, five to 10 years, even between a major clean out. Um, some of them will, again, the centers will die out of them. Um, and if you cut them back, they can get, uh, you can, you can get out the, the junk in the middle and then it'll, it'll fill back in too, or you can divide them. But, um, yeah, I if mean, you, if you don't want to, you can let them go for a couple years. If yeah. you don't cut them back, the only thing is that you're going to have a lot of, you might have a lot of density in that yeah. grass. And one benefit of not cutting them back though, is a lot of beneficials may overwinter in them. Yeah. And if, um, that's actually a wonderful thing in that case. Uh, in our modern landscapes, if you're, you know, you might get the, the HOA might be upset with you if you don't cut them back, uh, would be what I would say. You know? yeah. Okay. Somebody asked, is it too early to cut back Budlia? And I think we can just expand that to any. I typically do my Budlia around, like, ideally for me, uh, late uh, February into March, it, because just about that time, if I'm going to do any major pruning, uh, we're starting to warm up then. And so things will quickly um, go back to growing in the budley is if we have like another day of like we had there in December and say in the next couple of weeks, which we sometimes do have into February, um, they can get damaged. So I try to, I put off my budley of pruning typically till about the first of March. Cool. So. And I think the same with lantana. Lantanas, mm -hmm. I will cut them back regardless though. It won't hurt. Uh, salvia, some of the shrubby salvias are very similar to me on the budley, to the budleyas. Um, I trim, tend to trim them the end of February and into early uh, uh, to mid March. Okay. Somebody asked an interesting question. Let's assume today was a beautiful, glorious, sunshiny <laughs> day, and the thought to film this one inside never occurred to you. What would y'all have been doing? I was actually going to do roses and grasses. What cool. was I going to do? I don't remember. I don't know. I had an idea. We talked about doing uh, hardwood cuttings, I think, too. Yeah, but. we could do hardwood. Yeah, I probably would have, because Tim would have. Tim would have been like, we have to do it by rose so I can do my roses. I was going <laughs> to do it in the perennial border where I had both grasses in it and, oh, and yeah. Brad Prov right there. So Okay. Okay. Somebody asked time to root uh, brown fig cuttings. Wonderful. Actually, if 
if uh, Alexander turn, pans towards over here, we have some hardwood fig cuttings. Those uh, are and actually you can, a volunteer. Yes. He came in and we're housing them briefly. And he's going to actually propagate them to sell for a scholarship that goes to the Hort Department, I think. So it's a win-win for us by housing those a little bit. So, but um, yeah, uh, those he did those the first of January, or was it the yes. end of yeah? Yes. And so those are about less than a month yep. stuck. Uh, you can also with figs, you can stick them right in the ground. Um, and I think it's interesting. So you can see those are like leafed out, and the ones that I've looked at have not had roots on them. So they're leafing out, but they don't have roots. Yeah, they're starting. I mean, there were a couple roots, and they were callousing. We pulled one yeah. out for a, uh, our plant propagation workshop we did this past weekend, and they were starting to form what's called callus, uh, the undifferentiated t uh, um, uh, tissue uh, that uh, will hopefully turn into some roots. So. Okay. Um, somebody asked a question while we were talking about soil or substrate. They asked, would ProMix work? Yep. And basically what you described That's, is yeah. ProMix. Yeah, exactly. It's just a different brand. Yeah, I think sure. our brand is Sun Grow. It's yeah. a wholesale, yeah. uh, commercial grower media. Yeah. We get it by the pallet. I don't know how many bags are on a pallet. Probably a hundred. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fifty to a hundred bags. They bring it in on a skid steer. You probably don't want that at your house. No. <laughs> um, and somebody asked if you had to make your own substrate, what would you do? Um, I mean, if you can get, I would use like we said, peat, perlite. And uh, wood chips. Um, I would love. Is what I like. Well, I would for love to container try. purposes. Anyways. So there's two different things. Two, uh, so I think it's important to mention that there's two different things. Yeah. So there is propagation media. Yeah. I use the bagged, mixed media for that. Now, when I pot something up to put on the plant cart to root out, Actually. I put it in a pine bark. Um, it's just pine bark. Yeah. It's decomposed a little bit, but again, it doesn't have the, the, the fertilizer mixed in. Mostly, you can get it mixed, but that lets us fine tune it and, you know. What you might get similar things. to that in the uh, store would be um, soil conditioner, but yeah. allow it to rot down a little bit. Yeah, and soil that's, conditioner is not uh, decomposed at all. Yeah. Oh, we're going over. My alarm's going yeah. off. It's time yeah. for me to go home. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll wrap this up here shortly. Let's do... Well, okay, we'll wrap this up with one final question. Carolyn asks, when to move Eucomus outdoors? Let's just say, when yeah. can we move any tender thing outdoors? I would not plant them out right now when they're in full growth. These have been inside. They have not experienced frost. Uh, but um, if they're dormant, you can plant them out anytime. Uh, but if they're actively growing um, Yeah, the Eucomus right and the Colocasia. And is she, I mean, is she here in the southeast or is she from somewhere else? Do we know if uh, they're fully hardy from at least zone seven? Uh, south. Uh, if you go zone 6B, they'd be borderline and further north. You'd probably want to bring them in uh, and grow them uh, as a, a tender bulb that you dig in uh, seasonally. Uh, for us, they're, they're hardy as long as they're, they're dormant and they will, they, we can plant them any time. Yeah. Okay. And then, but you can plant them in the summer actively growing too. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Tim and Sophia, for pulling this together for us and telling us all what we can do in February in our gardens. And for all of you whose questions that I didn't quite get to because we were running a little bit long on time, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of March, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. horticulture hour, whenever there's five Wednesdays in a month, the last Wednesday we do a question and answer session. So you will have more opportunities to get your questions answered in the future. So no worries there. But thank you so much for tuning in with us today. We really appreciate it. And I hope you'll join us next week at three for our midweek program, Mark's going to be talking about Daphne, Edgeworthia, and relatives. And I don't know if you've been to the Arboretum lately and gone into the lab house, but the Daphne's starting to open up, which is a very exciting time of year. Very worth celebrating. So I hope you will join us next week for that. We'll see you then. Y'all take care. <laughs>